Bruce the Accounting Guy again here today, and today we're talking about accounts receivable and actually bad debt and setting up that allowance for bad debt accounts. Now, when we set up the allowance for bad debt, what we need to do is realize there are two methods acceptable under generally accepted accounting principles. Let's take a look at these two methods as we have them up here. Uh, basically, we establish our bad debt through estimates, accounting estimates, and we do them either as a percentage of sales or as a percentage of accounts receivable. When we do the percentage of sales, what we're attempting to do is match our bad debt against the sales that actually produce them. So therefore, we satisfy the matching principle here by, again, saying, well, if we didn't have sales on credit, we wouldn't have bad debt. So therefore, we might as well take whatever percentage of sales that we, that we have on credit and go ahead and take that percentage and record that as our bad debt expense. The other side of the coin is the percentage of receivables. When we take a percentage of receivables, what we're really doing is, is we're having an emphasis on the balance sheet itself instead. And when, when that happens, what we're doing is taking a percentage of our receivables and we're establishing what we believe the allowance account balance should be. As we go through these two methods, you'll see this will make more sense. These two methods can also be called uh, the income statement method and the balance sheet method based on where we what we calculate our percentages off of. Since we calculate our percentages off of sales, hence the income statement method, and we calculate our percentage off of receivables, hence the balance sheet. Um, before we move on and we calculate how, how, we, how we go through those calculations, let's take a look at the presentation of, of this allowance for doubtful accounts. When we look at our balance sheet, of course, we can see that uh, receivables would be under our current assets, and, um, and what's going to end up happening is, is that, we're, that we're going to, again, show our receivables, and our receivables, if we were to look, total $200,000. Though they total $200,000, that would be we would go to our subsidiary, we would look at every person's name one at a time, we could look at them, we could see that they owe us $200,000, but we know that we're really not going to collect all that $200,000. So what we do is we establish an allowance account, which shows through an accounting estimate what we believe we're not going to collect. And, and in this case, they're showing $12,000, and therefore we would put less allowance for doubtful accounts, and we would have that $12,000 total here. We would take that $12,000 and subtract it from the two hundred dollars and bring it over here as what we call our net realizable receivable. We're netting out our full receivable. Sure, our full receivables are 200000 if we were to look at everybody that owes us money, but at the same time we're saying that we know in real life that in doing business we're not going to collect that full amount. So what's our estimate as to what it is? It's $12,000. This has a credit balance and therefore is subtracted from our full amount and we're netting them out, and hence the name net realizable receivable, and it takes its place with all of our other current assets that we have. Now, how do we do these two methods? How do we determine what this balance is? It depends on which of the two methods we're going to use. So the first one we're going to use is a percentage of sales. On the percentage of sales, in the, it's in the percentage of sales basis method, basically what happens is management knows from doing business over the years that for every dollar of sales they make on credit that they're not going to collect the entire thing and therefore what's going to end up happening is is management is going to come up with a percentage that they know that they don't collect and they simply take that percentage and they multiply it times the total net credit sales for the year and they say that's what their bad debt will be so in this case they're in this example we're saying that um, the company had $800,000 in 2008 of net credit sales and that they have estimated through doing business that 1% of those sales will never really be collected. So they multiply the $800,000 by 1% of the net, by 1% and they come up with $8,000. They simply then say that's what we would not collect. They call that bad debt expense at the end of the year or the end of the period whenever we're actually doing this calculation we would debit bad debt expense for the eight thousand dollars and then we would indent and we would take the difference to the allowance for doubtful accounts and it would get credited eight thousand now the important number here is the eight thousand dollar credit 
because what we said was is under the percentage of sales, what we, all we want to do is take that percentage and make that our bad debt. So our bad debt becomes 8000 and this entry here is the byproduct to keep the entry equal. We're crediting the allowance account for $8,000. Um, again, when we come down and we were to analyze this in T accounts, the allowance for DAFO accounts does have a balance during the course at the end of the year of 1723. And we'll discuss how that balance changes throughout the year in our, in our next video. But what we need to understand is, is that it did have a balance there initially and that all we do is credit it for another eight, and it comes now the allowance account balance is 9723 We do not care in this method what the allowance account ends up being. The important thing under the percentage of sales is, is that we take a percentage of our sales, and whatever we multiply that by, that's our bad debt. This is the byproduct. It's just credited into that account and gives it a new balance. Now, this 9723 if we come back up here, that would be the number we would be showing here if this was that, that company instead. Okay, so that, that's what we want to do when it comes to using this method. Again, the whole key on this method, just simply take your sales for the year, your net credit sales or whatever number the problem supplies you, multiply it by the percentage given, you debit bad debt, and you credit the allowance account. It's just a byproduct to this whole thing. We're more concerned on recording this amount properly. And that's the percentage of sales. It's more concerned about the number going on the income statement. Now let's move on to the percentage of receivables. All right, on the percentage of receivables, it's a whole different approach. We're going to Again, what happens with the percentage of receivables, there's two ways to do it. We'll talk about both of those in a second. But the most common way is to do it what is called the aging of receivables. What would happen is, and here's what we have here, same as pretty, which is similar in your text, we have a listing of everyone that owes us money. And here's that listing right here. Um, we have one, two, three, four, five individuals, and then the word others to show that there's still $36,950 due to us from other individuals. Um, but again, we ha we're due a total of $39,600. And what we do to determine what our bad debt is going to be, because we know, of course, by doing business, we always have someone who's not going to pay us, especially in this time in the economy. What we're going to do is, is we're going to age them. And aging means to show how long each one of these dollars has been due to us. And as you can see, that as we move outward, again, most of our money still is current, but the farther out we get, hopefully, the less and less is due to us. So we can see that this money is really not yet due. We just made these sales, total of 27. Here we have out of this 39 $5,700, which is due to one, at one to 30 days. Um, the, next, the next amount due to us is 31 to 60 days out of this is still $3,000. The next amount is 2000 and still we have some people that owe us for over 90 days, they owe us $1,900. Um, from doing business, okay, the one thing that you need to realize is, is that the longer somebody owes you money, most likely the less chance you have of collecting it. And so what we do is we categorize these as into how long the money's been owed to us. And then as you can see, the company would assign percentages. They ba based again on how, on their being in business, they realize that at this point, usually 2% of these dollars are not collect, not, excuse me for a second. I'm sorry about this. I, I've got to take this call. If you can give me a second here. Hello. Sonny, yes. Well, well, yes, how did you know that I was taping it? And why are you calling? Oh, you want me to share your collection practices with my students. Well, well, they are a little bit um, unorthodox, Sonny. What do I mean by unorthodox? Well, I mean, Sonny, I mean, you go around and you, you yeah, yeah. well, I, I can share accounting practices with them, but collection practices, Sonny, I think are a little, oh, you can't make it over anyway. Okay, well, that's really good, but, oh, but you want to send Milo. Well, listen, Milo's a different story. Look, no, I do not think Milo should come over and show how to do limb 
manipulation, Sonny. It would not be a very good idea today. But I'll tell you what, why don't I just put you on my list, and if I, okay, okay, I will do that. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry for that interruption. Sonny is one of my oldest clients, and he was just trying to help out. Um, he has some really off-the-wall ways of collecting money from his customers, and a lot of times his customers end up off the wall. But I really did not want him coming over today and talking to you about that. But as far as Milo concerns, let's just say that Milo is a masseuse that occasionally just gets a little overzealous in what he does. But let's go back to what we were doing, and let's take a look again at the aging of the receivables. Now, when we age our receivables, again, we know that the farther out we go, that the, you know, the longer somebody owes us money, the less chance we have of collecting it. So hence you can see on this category of over 90 days, it's what, it's going to be 40%. So what we're going to do then is take each one of these dollar amounts due in these brackets and multiply them by the percentages. And when we do, you can see again, I mean, you can do the math, 2% of 27,000, 4% of 57, and we go through and we extend these out. And when we have these totals, this is our estimate as to what we're not going to collect out of each of those categories. We total them up. It comes out to $2,228. And when we do that, we're not saying that that's our bad debt. What we're saying there is, is that's what we're not going to be able to collect out of this $39,600. Now, this is a different focus. When we did that percentage of sales, we said that's what we wanted our bad debt to be. But when we do a percentage of receivables, which is what we did by category, by aging them, all right, instead what you want to do is, is you're calculating what you want your allowance account to be. So we're saying this is what our allowance account would, would be. So what we have to do is we have to look down at our allowance account and see what the balance is. At the end of the year, but prior to doing this, it was $528. I have that here, and I also have that here. It was 528. We need to move it to 2,228. So what do we have to do to get it from 528 to this 2,228 that we calculated? We need to add to it another, what, $1,700. So therefore, here's a credit to the allowance for doubtful accounts to $1,700 to move it to that 2,228. And it just so happens that the debit we need is the bad debt expense. So the, this time, the bad debt expense is the byproduct. It's not the main number that we were recording. The focus here on the percentage receivables, again, was to credit the allowance account for what it should be, and then the byproduct was the bad debt. And that's what's important under the percentage of receivables. We could use the shortcut percentage of the receivables. <coughs> Excuse me which would simply be to take one flat percentage times the 39.6. We could have done that instead of the aging process. That's called the shortcut method. But again, if we take a percentage times this number, whatever it comes out to be, that's what we want the allowance account to be. So if we had multiplied this by some flat percentage again, and it still came out to 2,228, that's what we want the allowance account to be. We have to look at the allowance balance, say what do we need to move it to the amount we just calculated, we credit the allowance account as we did for what we need to to get it there, and the bad debt expense is now the byproduct. Okay, so there's two different focuses here. Okay, now those are the two methods that are acceptable by, um, by generally accepted accounting principles. There is a third method that is not acceptable under a generally accepted accounting principles, and most small businessmen, like my client Sonny, who just called, use, and that's called the direct write-off method for uncollectible accounts. Now, first of all, the, he's calling back again. Hold on for a second. Yes, yeah, Sonny. Yes, I am talking about the direct write-off method. You are absolutely correct. And good. Okay. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right. So anyway, Sonny uses this direct write-off method for uncollectible accounts. And basically what he does is, he, he, again, he very rarely would have anything like this because of, his, of, of, of how prudent he is on his collections, which we won't talk about again. But generally what happens is, is that if Sonny sees a receivable on his books and he knows that that client is not going to pay him, 
he would directly take off the accounts receivable and record it directly to bad debt. Now, the reason that GAAP does not like this, generally accepted accounting principles, does not like this method is because it's manipulative. A client can write off any time they want a receivable and, and write it off the bad debt. So at the end of the year, which I wouldn't say Sonny would ever do anything like this, but if he had a big receivable and decided just to write it off because he didn't want to pick it up as income, he could write this off. He'd record the bad debt, and now it reduces his income that year. Now, next year, he knows he's going to collect it, and he picks it up as income in the following year, but he deferred it. He put it off, and he put off paying taxes on it for a year, which would not really be proper. Okay, and I would never let any of my clients do anything like that. So, again, this method is manipulative, and it's, it's not correct. Now, the other thing is, is that when you do write off an account this way, that means you're, redu you're actually taking them off right, off their subs they're right out of the subsidiary, and, the and their, their balance is gone forever. So, as I said before, it's not acceptable under joint accepted accounting principles. That's the first half of what we have for bad debt in this chapter. And I this is Bruce, the accounting guy, saying, see you again real soon.